Um, uh, yeah, uh, we. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I hope that you are all connected now, um, and you can hear us, and you can also see us. Um, thank you very much for coming to this workshop, uh, which is called Assessment of the State Air Quality Monitoring in Georgia. Uh, we are going to present today uh, the new analysis uh, prepared by expert of the Czech Hydrometeorological Institution, Jachim Březina. Uh, this workshop is organized by uh, Arnika from the Czech Republic, non-government organization, together with Green Pole from Tbilisi, our partner, uh, with the financial support of the Transition Promotion Program of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic. Uh, some of you might be participating at our workshop recently in Tbilisi, uh, where we invited also another expert of the Czech Hydrometeorological Institution, Blanka Krejci, who was explaining how the state air pollution monitoring works in the Czech Republic. So that was uh, uh, the first, let's say, from the series of the workshop uh, workshops to um, maybe transfer some experience from the Czech Republic or explain you how do we... Uh, how do we make the things here in the Czech Republic? Uh, today we continue a little bit and we will have a look uh, to the Georgian system and uh, also give some recommendations about how the Georgian monitoring system can be improved. And after this presentation, uh, Georgi Japaridze from Greenpool, our partner, will also uh, update you about what we do together and how we are trying to contribute uh, to, uh, let's say, covering the gaps in the information now uh, in Georgia and uh, what we would like to also still do till the end of year. Uh, if you will have any questions to, to the presentations, please ke keep them to the end uh, of the session. So after the presentation of Georgi, you can also ask uh, questions to Joachim. Uh, it will it will be probably uh, probably better for uh, for the course of the workshop, and after this workshop, you will also get all the presentations and all the materials that will be mentioned by email because you are registering through uh, Google Forms. So we have your contact details, and we will send you all the materials afterwards. So um, thank you very much for your attention, and now I would like to ask Joachim to uh, to start his presentation. So, um, good morning. Uh, my name is Joachim Jezina, as, uh, as Martin already said. Um, I currently work as the head of air quality department at the Czech Hydrometeorological Institute in the Czech Republic. Uh, he has also mentioned my other colleague, Blanka Krejci. Uh, and I was looking into the data and into the uh, current state of the um, station monitoring network, and I prepared a document. I will now share my presentation. Hopefully, you can, you can see it. Just let me know if you see it. Um, so um, it's basically based on that document, although um, I was looking at some of the things yesterday and uh, I have seen that some of the recommendations um, were already uh, implemented. I'm not sure if that was based on that document. So some of the things already deleted because I see them as, as uh, resolved. Um, so first of all, um, why should we care about air quality in general? I thought I would put some a few theory slides into my presentation, so that is just not the the uh, the practice, but also some theory. Um, and you can ob obviously use it when you argue with somebody. Why should you get money for this, etc.? Um, air quality is something everyone should be paying attention to. And uh, what is also important is that most of the global population breathes air quality, which does not satisfy uh, the recommendations from the World Health Organization. Uh, when I say most, I mean above ninety percent. Uh, in Europe, it's approximately 98%, um, globally about 91%, so it's, it's a vast majority. And what's also important is that air quality is currently considered uh, the number one environmental threat by the World Health Organization, which is responsible for approximately 7 million annual premature deaths. Uh, that number is obviously based on some models. It's not a calculation. Uh, some of that is... Uh, is uh, attributed to indoor pol uh, pollution. Some of it is to the uh, to the outdoor pollution. So um, it's just a number, but it is it is very important too. Uh, what I also sometimes use when I talk about why we should care about this is this slide, which I prepared. Um, what's interesting here is that if you think about it, 
an average person eats about two to three kilos a day and they drink about one and a half to three liters of water. Um, together, you have about six kilos. Uh, in contrast, what you breathe is when you count the number of the, the, the amount, the volume of air that you breathe per day, which is approximately 11,000 liters, which corresponds to 22,000 breaths. And each breath on average, if you're not doing some physical activity and you're a, a, a healthy adult, is about 500 milliliters. So that means that every day you breathe 14 kilograms of, of air, which is twice as much as you eat and drink together. People care about what they eat. They care about what they drink. And this is a clear example of why they should care about what they breathe. Um, and then another uh, basic slide which shows uh, what are the potential consequences of uh, polluted air. And as you can see, it basically affects all the most important organs in, in human body, uh, such as the, 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 the brain, uh, the cardiovascular system, lungs, obviously, but also liver. It can affect skin aging, reproductive system, and there are many other uh, potential uh, effects. Although it should be said that most of them are long-term, which means that um, the, it's all about probability. Some people, they, uh, they have, a, we could say, good genetics and, uh, and they can survive some much more than someone else. And it's all about probability. Usually uh, these diseases are some sort of a cancer, which is always uh, multifactorial, which means there are multiple factors uh, such as lifestyle, smoking, etc. But overall, you can say that uh, long-term exposure to high concentrations of pollutants can affect the entire body. And then obviously you also have some, um, some uh, susceptible groups, groups of people who are more susceptible to uh, high concentrations of pollutants. And that would include uh, little children, that would include the elderly, older people, uh, as well as pregnant women, uh, people with long-term diseases of the uh, lung system or the, the respiratory system or the cardiovascular system, but also people who are healthy but are just recovering from some acute disease such as COVID, for example. So if somebody just has COVID or just has had a COVID, their immune system is weakened and they can be uh, more susceptible to air pollution. And here is just a summary of the groups that I was talking about and what you should do. Um, so if the, if the air quality is really bad, then people should, for example, reduce physical activity outside, uh, but they should still make sure that they ventilate if they're indoor, because if you stay indoor without ventilating for too long, sooner or later, the um, air quality will be worse uh, inside than outside. Now, uh, let's have a look at the, at the, uh, the um, air quality aspects, like what you should be caring about when you want to some, some sort of monitor air quality. So first you have to talk about the ambient air quality station network. In other words, the stations, the points, the localities where you actually monitor, the devices that do this, uh, the technicians that are responsible for maintaining the system, which is uh, very important. Then you have to talk about the legislation, which is how the legislation is um, is uh, basically saying what are the threshold values, what needs to be monitored. Then you have some sort of the, the analysis uh, and assessment. They go sort of together uh, where you look at the data. But assessment basically means making some conclusions. Uh, analysis in this case means things like analyzing, analyzing the data. And in this respect, what is very important is data verification. So um, you need to make sure that somebody is looking at the data um, in our case, for example, here at CHMI, we do this on a daily basis. So it includes both looking at the already measured data and um, sometimes you just have nonsense there, uh, just like any other device, it can sometimes go wrong. So you have to look at it. You have to look what are the potential causes of this? Is it a technical issue? Was there some, some kind of a immediate source? So for example, somebody uh, was burning something right next to the station. So that would obviously influence the station a lot. But it also includes looking at whether the station is in operation at all. If there is some outage, if, for example, there are no data, then a technician needs to go there as soon as possible so that the station, again, is, is functional. And then, obviously, publication, which is also very important because, um, ideally, uh, the general public people should have access to the information, uh, either in real time or at least uh, in terms of historical values, so they can, for example, look at some kind of a report uh, that goes out annually and talks about the uh, the situation. Um, 
Now let's be more specific and talk about the ambient air quality monitoring stations in Georgia. So um, I went through the documents and um, the, what I've seen from the latest documents that I've seen uh, in 2014, there was only one modern automated station uh, in, in Tbilisi and three outdated non-automated non stations. Then in the next four year or five year period, um, uh, passive sampling was implemented. Now, passive sampling is a, is a great tool which can give some sort of an orientational value, rough value of the concentrations. Uh, it can never be uh, compared to the automated active sampling. Uh, so it basically is good in this case because it can give you an idea of where we should concentrate on and for example, where we should place a active sampling station. Uh, the advantages of a passive sampling obviously is for example, access to electricity, which in this case is usually not necessary. So it is much easier to install it, but as I said, it has to be then, if you think that somewhere is a problem, it needs to be combined with an active sampling because that's what can be compared to the legislation values. And then um, basically, the, if you look at it in this perspective, we went from one to four, which is a 400% four, increase in the number of automated stations. Um, and then in 2021, uh, uh, the, the report included data from seven, uh, seven automated stations. So uh, even though seven is not much, it's... Um, it's seven times more than uh, than uh, seven years ago, which I think is is good. And then, what are the air pollutants? So here are some of the basic ones. So we have the suspended particles PM10, PM2.5. Those are the uh, I would say the basic ones. When um, World Health Organization talks about air pollution, they usually talk about PM2.5. That would be the representative of the overall pollution. Uh, because also the smaller the particles, the more potentially dangerous they are to your health. So even though we measure both, these are the more important ones. Um, we can already measure PM1, for example, which are even smaller. Uh, we already do it here in our network. Um, we even have some stations which are uh, focused on ultra fine particles, particles in the range of seven, uh, up down to seven nanometers, which is like um, basically more than a thousand times less than PM10. Uh, although I have to say that we also have this still in an experimental mode. We do not use it in, in a, on a day-to-day -day basis. We only have a few stations and we're sort of testing it uh, because it's a, it's a new technology, but potentially extremely um, important because it's really the small particles that matter the most. Also, when you start looking at the small particles, you basically care more about the number of particles more than the overall concentration. Why is that? It's because um, when you talk about concentrations in micrograms per meter cubed, for example, um, the large particles can have a really large concentration, but it can only be one particle, which is heavy, large and heavy. While the very small particles, they can have a relatively negligible mass, very small weight. So they will have a very low concentration, but because there is lots of them, they can be very dangerous to your health. Um, this was also implemented in, for example, um, uh, traffic uh, norms, so emission values for cars, where the latest European standard, the Euro 6, already includes number of particles in addition to the actual concentrations. Uh, and that made a lot of issues for the car manufacturers. It was very difficult for them to implement. Then we have nitrogen dioxide. Uh, usually a very important source of this is traffic. Uh, sulfur dioxide, usually some kind of industry. Carbon monoxide, also traffic. Ground level ozone, I will talk about that with specific benzoapyrin heavy metals, uh, benzene. Um, what is then also important is uh, meteorological parameters. Um, why? Um, it's explained here, and you will see this in your presentation, so I will not read it, but if someone's interested, they can read it. Um, basically, um, it's important because sometimes these uh, meteorological parameters can have a dominant effect on the concentrations and usually the differences between years. Uh, so uh, for example, a different concentrations in 2022 compared to 2021, uh, it's usually the case that the emissions don't change that quickly. Uh, you have changes in the, um, in, you know, people buy new cars, um, industries, uh, they exchange some technology for a cleaner one, but this is sort of a slow, gradual process. While these conditions can change very quickly, it can be uh, more rain, more wind. Um, 
And so you always have to look at this, also the wind direction, for example, which gives you a good idea of where this pollution is coming from. And um, so what I read in that document was that in, in the Georgian meteorological stations, uh, the, these conditions are not directly measured and at the monitoring stations, but at the general meteorological stations that, uh, that are there in the country, which is in some respects limiting because Okay, air temperature is relatively okay. It's usually the case that um, if you have a city and you have four meteorological stations, they will usually measure more or less in a long-term average, almost the same. Uh, but wind speed and wind direction can be very tricky because these parameters can change. Uh, it depends on the buildings uh, around. It depends on various other aspects. So even if the meteorological station is, let's say, less than a kilometer away, these values can be dramatically different. Because um, if, for example, there is a building right next to the station, there will be one direction from which there will be no, uh, no flow. There will be no wind from that direction if there is a building. While the ambient air quality station that is standing, let's say, 300 meters away, that building is not there next to that station. And that can be a flow from that direction. So it is, from my experience, using meteorological data from other location, even if it's very close, can be tricky when you talk about wind speed and wind direction, because you cannot really rely on that. So this basically would be one recommendation to try to equip the um, air quality monitoring stations with also a, a wind uh, anemometer, so wind direction, wind um, speed sensor or, or, or measurement. And ideally air temperature, although if this was not possible, I would say this is the most important. Um, you can also measure precipitation because, as I talk about on this slide, um, the rain uh, amount also has an effect on uh, air quality. But again, um, rain can be very local, but usually uh, in long term, it is not so much dramatically different uh, in, a, in, a, in a similar area. So in my opinion, this one, wind speed and wind direction are the most important, which usually require to be measured exactly at the same point for a valid uh, analysis of the data. Um, now, here is a list of stations that I found in May 2023. These are the seven automated stations. Now, you can immediately see that most of them are traffic stations, although there are two background stations. Uh, and I will talk about these stations uh, in a moment. Uh, so this is another limitation, in my opinion, because Four of these stations are in the capital city, right? Which has a population of 1.184 million. This is what I found on the internet. Um, I have to admit, I'm not an expert on, on Georgian geography, but what I found was that these three cities are one of the largest, it, or basically the second, third, and fourth largest. And if you look at the population, they really are a large uh, cities. Now, this creates a potential problem because we're basically measuring either urban environment, or maybe in some cases suburban, but there are no stations in the, uh, in the rural environment. Um, what we do, and I will show you uh, later on on our web page, is we, for example, create maps. We use models which create maps uh, of the pollution, and these models are able to extrapolate the values to every single region, although we do not measure everywhere. But it's very difficult and almost impossible to do if you have basically no information about what's happening outside of these large cities. Uh, you then only rely maybe on the passive measurements. But again, as I said, these are only very rough approximate things and they cannot be legally compared to the threshold values because that would probably not satisfy the, uh, at least not, not the European standards for measurements. Um, here is the legislation that I found. And this is great because it's 100% uh, same as we have in Europe, also here in the Czech Republic. Um, so we have various limit values. The only one that is different is PM 2.5. And I'm not sure if the document I've seen is not updated or if this is still uh, uh, valid, but in the Czech Republic, this and, and Europe, this limit for the PM 2.5, which I said are one of the most important ones, or if not the most important one, uh, has been reduced in Europe as of 2020 down to 20 micrograms per year. So. This is now different and it used to be 25 and it is possible. And maybe at the end, you can tell me if this is still 25 or maybe it's also has been reduced to 20, um, which again is uh, 
I can explain one other important aspect is when you present the data to the public, um, it's always uh, important to explain some of it. Because uh, if you imagine you have a station that has a, an annual average of 20, 22, let's say 22, 22 micrograms per uh, meter cubed per year, and it's 2019. Uh, and that station 22 is below 25. So you say that that station is fine, does not exceed the limit. And the next year you reduce the limit to 20. And this annual average on that station is reduced from 22 to 21. However, 21 is now above 20. And you say that this station exceeded the limit. If you only leave the public with the information that this station now exceeded the limit, you will end up with the people thinking that it's getting worse, although it can be quite the opposite. So this is just a, an example of why we also produce various reports, and, and I've seen some of yours too, but it's just to emphasize that really people usually do not understand these things and it's necessary to explain to them uh, the actual situation and what it looks like. Also, when you look at, when somebody asks, okay, so is it getting better? Um, they must not look at the value from last year because it just depends also on the weather and other factors which uh, come into play. And so when you look at what's the, what's the trend, um, we usually, we never assess trend on a, on a time series that is uh, shorter than five years. So I would say five years is, a, is an absolute minimum to assess trends. Uh, 10 years is, is ideal. We already have stations that have a, a, a time series of 50 years. Obviously that takes time, uh, but that, those would be ideal for looking at what the long-term trend uh, looks like. Now, from what I've seen again, so the data is presented uh, on an interactive map. Um, the markers are colored based on the actual values. And they're available at this page. Uh, the historical data are available on this page and it allows downloading historical data from all the automated station in a daily, monthly and annual reports. And I have to say, I was very pleasantly surprised uh, by this because it's very well presented. Um, I would even say that in terms of the way the, these reports can be downloaded on a daily basis, I think we could take a, an example of this and, and implement this ourselves because in our case, it's not that simple to download. Um, so this is great. The only issue that I had here was that there were some annual reports and they were only available uh, until I think 2017. But I looked yesterday and there was already a report from 2021. So I think that no longer is an um, issue. So. Again, this, I think, is a very, uh, very strong part of the monitoring right now. And uh, if you look at, so if you look at the strengths, um, I would say that is the threshold values, which um, are set very well, and they correspond to what is the current knowledge of the health issues related to air, air pollution. Uh, likewise, the pollutants, the range of pollutants that are monitored is, is, is extensive and is, I would say, sufficient. Um, it's also great that there is the online monitoring so that there are stations that can produce hourly values or daily values. Um, the current data is presented in a clear manner using the map uh, and the historical up-to-date data is publicly available. And uh, it's also available in a machine readable Excel format, which can seem like a, a, a minor thing, but it's actually very good because that allows other people, journalists, et cetera, to work with the data uh, and you can even maybe then cooperate with other organizations. So that's very good. Now, what are the weaknesses? So as I've said, uh, one weakness, which will take time, is that the station network is only uh, based on seven automated stations. And as I've said, that they're all located in the largest cities and that also most of them, 70% of them, are automated traffic stations. So um, you would also probably need, uh, I would expect at least, for example, one industrial station. If there are some industries, then there should be an industrial station. And the background stations are uh, usually outnumber the traffic stations. In, in general, in, in European countries, you would have more background stations than traffic stations. The reason for that is that um, the background stations can differ. They, they depend on many different factors. Uh, background station is affected by everything that's around. Um, so it's very, usually very difficult to just guess, have a guess of how much, what, what uh, the pollution is there. In contrast, the traffic station um, is affected most by the traffic nearby. And if you know how many cars, for example, pass on that road, and if there is a different road somewhere in other city, which has the same amount of traffic, the same number of cars, 
you can very well estimate the air pollution because you would expect that the the, the cars, the type of cars, etc., is usually very similar. And uh, so if you have just that one source, which is mostly the traffic, you can guess, you can guess very well. But it, the background stations are much more difficult to guess. So that's why we have more background stations because they make more sense and they make it uh, easier to estimate the, uh, the basically the concentrations at a, at a large area. Uh, you also have to think about the fact that a traffic station, each of these stations we say that has a certain representativeness, i.e. they represent a certain area a background station can represent a very large area. It can be dozens of kilometers. It can be even hundreds of kilometers uh, for the background region, while the traffic station basically represents just that region where you measure and maybe then the concentrations along the road, not around, but along the road. Um, so that's, that's why they're sort of limited in this way. Um, then what I found is just, an, uh, uh, this is the annual reports. I, I forgot to delete it here, but that I think is now okay. Uh, and the historical data do not include units, at least what I downloaded did not include units. Um, and it should probably be there because in some cases, I think that at least for carbon monoxide, it seemed like milligrams per meter cube for the other one micrograms. So especially if you really have different units, then they should be specified because otherwise people can compare the values and they're comparing different units. Um, yeah, and then the fact that you cannot download an annual data, you have to download monthly, but again, that is, I would say, a very minor thing. What is maybe more important, and I've talked about it, is that the meteorological data is not monitored at the actual stations, which is important, especially for the wind speed and wind direction. Now, here we have some sort of the sources. This is just a summary. And um, what I always say when I show this slide is that um, what people should realize is that there are natural sources of air pollution it can be wildfires, it can be volcanic activity, it can be soil erosion, etc. So a zero concentration is, uh, is, a, is a never possible scenario. So there will always be some sort of a pollution. Um, and especially in, uh, in the case of Georgia, uh, there are probably more problems with, for example, the, the dust that can be transported along a very long distance. And there's not much you can do about it. That's, that's the truth. And that uh, should be explained to the people that in some ways, it's not like we can go down to zero. Uh, it's not always in the hands of the government or anyone to ac actually uh, uh, make sure that the, the air is 100% clean. That's not possible. Um, here are the air pollution sources. Um, so if we look at, for example, the particulate matter, uh, we see that um, basically, the most important factors are uh, energy and industry. Um, this is relatively very different from what we have here in the Czech Republic. Uh, in the Czech Republic, the issue is mostly with households, with local heating, because um, we live in a colder environment and what people have, the, the old boilers they have at home, they are uh, sometimes very, very polluting the environment. So that in our case, that's the most important example of, of pollutants. However, in this case, it's the energy and industry. Um, what, from, again, from the experience from our country, um, the, before the Velvet Revolution, uh, in other words, in the 80s, um, the priority was the industry, not the environment. And it was also the case that the highest pollution, pollutants were the factories, were the, um, the industries. However, there is a much more you can do about that. You know, if you set an, a certain emission limit and they do not satisfy it and they have to report what they measure, at least in Europe, they, every factory has a report what they emit. And if they don't fulfill or they, they comply with the limits, uh, they're closed down. They just receive a, a, a prohibition of, of operation and they have to close down. Same with the cars. Every car here has to go every, I think, two years. Uh, for a check, and if the emissions of that car are not complying with what that car should emit, that car can no longer is no longer uh, uh, compliant with being on the road. Uh, so now we have problems with the households because there is millions of households here, and it's impossible to check every single house household what they use for heating and check it every day. Why I'm saying it is because in a ideal situation, this is something that can be relatively or not easily, but it's much more easy. It's easier to control this than to control the individual households because just because the number of factories, it's much lower and um, the government has much more uh, ways to make these industries 
emit less. What you can have a larger problem with are the natural sources. And unfortunately, in that case, there is usually not much you can do. Uh, but again, so if this is the number one pollutant, that is relatively not good, but it's a, it's a sign that there is a potential for, for improvement. Um, ammonia, uh, agriculture, that's the same everywhere. It's mostly uh, fertilizers. And then we have industry in the case of uh, sulfur uh, oxides. Uh, and when I said that we, usually, we largely um, reduced the effect of industries in the Czech Republic, the, the concentrations of SO2 are currently so low that we even struggle to measure them. Uh, the devices can no longer detect them in some cases. So that's just an example of how we can improve when we reduce the, um, the uh, industries. Uh, in contrast, when we talked about benzoipyrin, which is, uh, which is this, this one, that's the one that we struggle the most in the Czech Republic because it's 98% from the local heating. And I have not found data about benzoipyrin in these statistics, uh, but I would assume that they will be lower because uh, just because there's not so much uh, not so much old boilers and heating, and then we have volatile organic compounds, carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxides. As we can see, as I said, nitrogen oxides mostly in mostly cars um, and uh, and also agriculture. Um, so obviously, this categorization is very general, and in reality, there are more emission sources. Uh, so, for example, we found that construction works can be an extremely large uh, pollutant. So when you, for example, uh, uh, when you, for example uh, are destroying a building or, or uh, just constructing any building or something, there is a lot of pollution, especially PM10, which are the larger particles. And what these data also showed when I looked at the long-term trends is that um, the PM emissions remain more or less constant in absolute values, uh, although the sectors sector shares change so uh, the energy sector is decreasing industry sector is increasing and uh, there is a minor increase in nitrogen oxide emissions due to the increasing number of vehicles in the country um, usually this again depends so here in the czech republic we have an increasing number of vehicles but we also have an increasing number of new vehicles and these new vehicles are much cleaner than the old ones it's it sometimes even said that 90 percent of uh, pollution from traffic is from 10% of vehicles, and it's very close to the reality. So um, this natural um, uh, replacement of the vehicle fleet helps a lot. Um, so I've talked about long-range transport, which can, of course, be relevant to uh, any place on Earth. Uh, we struggle with long-range transport from uh, Poland, for example, where the heating is, a, is even a bigger problem than here. I guess in your case, it can be, for example, the uh, desert dust, etc. And this always depends on what the source is. If it's anthropogenic, then, it's, then it can be solved. If it's natural, then that can be a problem. And even in the Czech Republic, we sometimes have dust from Sahara Desert, and there is not much we can do about it. But uh, fortunately, that's very, very rare. Um, and then I've looked at the values from the last year, uh, just to have an idea of what the actual values are. Um, and what we, can, what we need to look at first is the data availability. So in our case, what we use at CHMI is a threshold value of 90%. If a station does not have values or data from more than 10, for more than uh, more or equal to 90% of the year, then we do not use it for the evaluation. Um, why is that? It's because um, overall, each pollutant usually has some kind of an annual trend. Um, usually it's the case that it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, the concentrations are higher in the colder part of the year. So if you have a station that only measured half a year, uh, and in some cases it's the opposite. In case of ozone, for example, is the opposite. But if you have a station that only measured half a year, those values are biased. You cannot just use it as an as a annual average. And when I looked at the data availability, it was very good, actually. Uh, if you look at the numbers um, in most of the stations uh, in 2022, uh, the data availability is very high, here even 100%, that's, that's, that's excellent. Uh, but even numbers like 99% are great because that means that station was in operation 362 days of the year. The only issue was here, um, and it's not here to show you that this particular thing is a problem. It's more to show that it's actually quite good, but you need to pay attention to this. And uh, I'm not sure if you have such a value, but we use 90%. Uh, so there can be a maximum of th uh, 36 days gap in the annual data. 
And if there's more, then that station does not have an annual average. You can still use the monthly averages, but not, do not compare it with other annual averages because that value can be biased. And we will see why. So here are just some of the, the annual concentrations. Um, again, this is, this is quite good. If you, these uh, red, thing, these red uh, bars are traffic stations, these green ones are the background stations. It is actually interesting that this background station has higher concentrations. I guess it depends on where it's placed. And I have to say, I'm not an expert on the location. So if there's some factory nearby, or maybe it's, uh, it's um, in an open area where it's more affected by the natural sources. But overall, I would say this is good. Uh, the values are mostly below the limit, at least at these, uh, these stations. And as you can see, I've omitted this one because we've seen that it only has 56%. And if you look, uh, if you look uh, for the, uh, further, uh, you see the, the monthly differences. And what's important here is if you look, um, these stations, uh, even though they differ in the absolute values, you can see that there are the same trends. This goes up, down, up, down. And I'm not now uh, going to speculate why it goes up, why it goes down. But it just shows you that they're affected in a similar way. And if one station did not measure here, and did not, for example, did not measure in April and did not measure in August, then if you counted that for the annual average, that station would have a, a much lower average, even though it would probably have a higher value here. So that's why it would be biased. Um, this is probably the biggest issue I found in terms of the air pollution as such. Um, it's the number of exceedances of the PM10 limit. And I would assume it's probably due to some of the natural sources. But this is probably also the biggest difference from what we see here in Europe. Uh, currently, we are basically below the limit at all the stations here in the Czech Republic. So we're, last year, for example, we even had stations with zero exceedances. Uh, but usually we are somewhere near 10, 15 at most. And as you can see here at this station, there is 186, which means that basically every other day uh, this limit was exceeded. And um, I'm, again, I'm not going to speculate. Uh, it, maybe it's some kind of a natural source, which, um, which is problematic because the, there's not much you can do about it. However, um, when you talk about these natural sources, one good thing about them is that usually if you look at the actual uh, composition of these particles, they're much less toxic than, for example, particles from some combustion processes. So if it's, for example, a dust from a desert, that composition of that particle will mean that it's probably not so toxic for the population. But in such case, it's then important to actually make sure that it really is a natural source and do some kind of an analysis of what, what these particles uh, contain. Uh, then we have the PM2.5. Again, this is a very good. And, and it shows you that probably, I would assume, that it's some kind of a source that produces large particles, because otherwise this limit would also be exceeded, but it's not. The small particles are um, in a much lower concentrations, which means that it could, for example, be the desert dust, which would cause uh, this high exceedance here, but low values of the PM2.5. And I would be more concerned if this was high. If this was high, that would mean it's not a natural source, uh, unless it's some wildfire. Um, but this is lower, and that's actually more important, because if this was high, that would present a much higher risk for the population. And again, you see the trend. And I would say that here you can already see that it's also the case that in the colder part of the year, you have higher concentrations. It could be heating. It could be other issues. But if some station only measured in this region, in this um, period, it would have a, a biased average uh, or if only measured in the, in the cold part of the year. Nitrogen dioxide. Here you can see that this traffic station, probably it's some kind of very heavy traffic loaded and it has a higher concentrations. But overall, uh, I would say that we had these values about 10 years ago. Now we're below the limit at all stations in the Czech Republic, but this is still good. Um, not sure what happened here, but overall it's, it's relatively good. Sulfur uh, dioxide, these values are very low, even compared to the limits, the, the limits being 125, 350. These are, these are low values. Um, and ozone, which is uh, problematic because it uh, does not have source, really. It uh, is created in the atmosphere from reactions. And this, that reaction is catalyzed by sunlight and high temperatures. And there is not much you can do about it. It's currently the only pollutant in the Czech Republic and Europe, really, which does not have a decreasing trend. Because as we have global warming, it's getting warmer. Uh, there is more sunshine. Uh, the ozone concentrations go higher. And there's not much we can do about global warming in short term. Obviously, we're trying to do something about it, but it's going to take time.
And you can see it here again that in the summer you will have the highest concentrations. So the trends here are basically the same as we have here uh, in Europe. And just to give you an idea of maybe uh, some comparison, uh, because I was asked to talk about our network too. So just very quickly, what we have is approximately 200 stationary automated stations. Czech Republic is approximately the same size as Georgia in terms of the total area. So we have 200 stationary automated stations, which are located in such a way that we can represent the entire uh, region. We have background, traffic, and industrial stations. We have urban, suburban, rural, and uh, they are not um, evenly distributed. So it's not that you should have uh, every, uh, let's say, 20 kilometers squared, you should have one station. That's not the case. Uh, we have more stations in areas that are problematic, but we still have a few stations even in the areas where we see that the air pollution is low so that we can make sure that it remains low. So if we looked at map, and I have a map behind me, but you probably cannot see it, the stations are not evenly distributed, but we have an idea of what's happening everywhere and where we have issues, there we place more stations. So we have regions in the Czech Republic which historically are uh, more industrial and there is more stations there. Um, however, um, I, I should say, and, and it's nice to say that uh, we probably have the most dense network in, the, in Europe and the network in Europe is the most dense in the world. So in a way, we are basically at the top. So um, I would say even if you had 100 or 50, it would still be very good. Uh, we also have, um, uh, we have six regional offices. So I work in one of them. We have five other regional offices. And so we have technicians which operate the network because you, we're, we're similar size of you and it's not possible for one office for the technicians to basically go to every station because as I said, the maintenance is very important. And if there is, for example, no data, something happened to that station, a technician immediately goes to that station. And so that they don't spend a day just traveling there, we have six regional offices where the tech technicians and the uh, uh, experts are based. And um, we also have some special purpose measurements. So what we have is, a, is a, a measuring vehicle. It's a basically an automated professional station on wheels, uh, like a little truck or van. And that van can go anywhere when we want. And we can do some short-term analyses of places where we, for example, do not have that long-term monitoring. So that can also be very useful if, for example, you do not have the resources to build 50 stations. If you at least have, for example, two or three of these vehicles, you can place them somewhere for two, three months and at least have an idea of what's happening there and then go to another place because it's very difficult to move that station as such. And you still need a few stationary stations that stay at the same spot so that you can look at the long-term trends. Um, and just for interest, we also do some scientific work in the field of air quality. And one thing that we have here in Brno, for example, it's, a, it's very special, I would say. Uh, they do this, for example, in the US and um, we're the only in the Czech Republic that focus on this is a particle analysis using a scanning electron microscope, which is this device. It's a, it's a very expensive and sensitive device, which can actually look at the individual particles. And that can, for example, be used to look at the size, shape, and the chemical composition of the particles. And it's then, for example, used for the identification of uh, potential sources of those particles. So I develop a software that analyzes this and my colleague, um, develops the methodology of how to uh, sample the particles and how to analyze them. So it's just an example. We have more uh, of these experimental scientific uh, things that we then go to conferences and, and, and try, to, um, try to do some progress in the global uh, air pollution monitoring. Uh, so in conclusion, I would say that um, the monitoring system currently is on a good track. Uh, what is very positive is the number of stations is still low, but it's increasing. Um, also, what I think is very good is the data presentation. I think that really is a very strong part of the monitoring that people can really look at the data, they can download it, they can download it in a machine readable format. That's very good. What I was missing was that report, that analysis, that word analysis, some sort of sentences about the data because people usually don't understand the numbers. Yeah. So even though it's very good that it's there, it will be used by only a very small minority of people because most people do not understand the numbers. Uh, so the fact that now the reports are there uh, available until 2021, that basically solves the issue. And um, what should then be do, done is basically try to um, extend the network. And um, I'm not sure, but for some of the pollutants that are mentioned in the threshold values, so for example, the benzoate pyrene or benzene, 
I did not find any data in the historical data section. Um, I'm not sure, maybe it's somewhere else. Uh, so I apologize if I didn't find it, but if I'm not sure if it's not measured or if it's not published. And um, also what I noticed is that all the data, even data a few years back are still labeled as not, ver not verified data. Um, so I'm not sure if the verification does not occur or if it's just there and it is verified, but what we do is we publish online data. So we publish current values that were measured hour ago. But then when we publish the historical data, monthly, annual, we always publish only uh, verified data because um, then we make sure that there are no errors in the data and that people do not misinterpret the values. So I would look into why all the data is labeled as not verified. So if that verification does not take place, that would again be something that should be implemented because it's very important to verify the data. And if it is verified, then just make sure that it doesn't say it's not verified. And um, then in terms of the actual air pollution values, I would say that the biggest issue I found was the 24 hour limit, which in some cases is, is exceeded uh, several fold. Uh, in that case, it really depends. Some maybe um, it's not possible to reduce it if it's some natural source. So why, that's why I said here, it should uh, be identified what the problem is. If it has not already been, maybe it has. And then a maximum effort should be made to improve the air quality at that particular location. Um, maybe I can show you one other thing, and I hope you see my screen. Uh, what I wanted to show you is that uh, what we produce is, um, can you see the screen just to make sure? Yeah. So what we have, I can show you, for example, the reports that we do. Uh, it's in Czech, but um, we have these, um, if you look at our web page, uh, we have these maps where you see the current values. You can also, so right now, for example, you also see a similar map, color-based current values. You can then look at them here. Uh, so these are the stations that are currently measuring what the values are. And then we have these um, tabular reports, which is very similar to what you have. Um, so that looks like this. So we have these tables where you select a pollutant. So annual averages, for example. Uh, not, it, now it's only the ending. Oh, I'm OK. Saying. Sorry. Uh, I will. I'll try again. Um, so OK. So oh, here is no. a table of, of the values. You can download them as a PDF. Or we then have, um, we then have um, something similar where you can go to historical data, air quality, and then here. Um, you select a year, you select a station, uh, and then you can download. So for example, 1972, only uh, uh, sulfur dioxide was measured at that year, and you can download a CSV file. Um, so this is the tabular values. Then what I was showing before, and sorry you didn't see my screen, was that you have the current values here. Um, so if you look at this map, you see them here, and you can also click here and see the current values. If you select a specific station, then you see the last hours, what it looked like including the meteorological parameters, which are measured at that station directly. And then every year we produce, this is what I've been trying to achieve, and this is what I'm responsible for, is creating these graphical reports where you actually have a, a web report, sort of, uh, where you have some summary, and all these graphs are interactive, so you can zoom them and do all sorts of things. And then we can look at, for example, air quality in the Czech Republic. You select the pollutant. And then here you also have these maps that I talked about. Um, and we, we're currently working on a, an interactive map that you can also, that will also be able to zoom in, et cetera. Currently we have these maps. And for this, you obviously need stations uh, across the entire uh, country. And so, so these are the reports that we produce. They're quite extensive, but um, yeah, there's various chapters. You have a chapter about the meteorological conditions. So here we have temperatures, rain, uh, dispersion conditions, which are very important. Um, so we have all, all these sorts of reports. Um, and the last thing I will, I will show you is um, I've created this page, which sh should show, um, I'm not sure this will work. Uh, okay, uh, never mind. Um, we have these, if you look, this basically shows the location of the, of the stations. This, these are only the, um, the automated ones. Uh, then we have manual stations, which do not produce online data. Those are used for the heavy metals and benzoapyrin. These compounds we cannot measure in real time, so they're done in a laboratory uh, with a certain delay. So these are not all the stations. 
there are more. Um, but what you can see here is basically, as I said, for example, this is the problematic region. Uh, this is the industrial part of the Czech Republic. Also this, partly. And then these are, this is Prague. This is the capital. This is the city where I'm from. And so you see that really the stations are practically everywhere, but they are uh, more concentrated in areas such as large cities or the industrial zones. Uh, and then we make sure that we have stations. For example, this one is in, in, a, in a village. This one is absolutely a bad. This is in, a, in the middle of a field. There is nothing around. That one's focused on agriculture, etc. Uh, these are usually traffic stations, which are next to large roads. And so that's how we cover uh, the entire region. Uh, and I think I think that's probably it. And I'm sorry we went a bit over time, but it's now your turn, obviously, to to ask any questions or maybe. Um, have any anything to say to to what I've said? Okay. Um, see, someone raised their hand. Thank you very much Hi. for the presentation, Yanini. Hi, hello. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Yahim, for your uh, report, for your presentation. It's very interesting and it's very valuable for us. And I just want to comment uh, about the uh, threshold values for the PM 2.5 particles. As you've said, uh, I just checked the uh, uh, report on the state of environment for the years of uh, 2017 and 2021, and they have reduced the threshold value to 20 uh, micrograms per square meter of air. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, and do you have any ideas about the data verification? Is it is it actually something that is happening and is just not implemented on the web page, or is it something that is that you just measure the data and that's and then it's presented as it is? Oh, well, uh, uh, the public information that we have, it just says that it's not verified data. We don't know what they're doing behind the scenes because, okay. uh, yeah, what's available on the uh, internet and online, it says that it's not verified. So that's uh, still a major issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, I think, really, uh, it is then very important, like, even if it was verified and the data on the web was not verified, that would be an issue because then people can misinterpret it various ways. But even a bigger issue would be if the data was not verified. So maybe that's something to try to ask or check uh, that somebody really is looking at the data. And we have, for example, six people every day, full time, uh, just looking at the data. They cooperate closely with the technicians. Uh, they are there to check uh, gaps in data, stations not functioning. But also, for example, sometimes it's difficult because sometimes um, these devices, they, they have to be calibrated. So it's not like you build a station and there it is and it works. It has to be maintained at least two times a year. And uh, overall, over time, the, any device, any measuring device, including an analy analyzer, they drift. It's called a drift. It goes away from the reference values naturally. Um, so every we do it every half a year. We... Um, Sorry, uh, we calibrate it back to the reference, but sometimes it can happen even uh, sooner. And then you see one day it goes higher. That's nothing, nothing interesting. Obviously, if you have a peak like this, you try to look at what happened. Uh, if you have a very small increase, that's fine. You don't notice anything. And if after a week or a month, you notice that it goes higher, 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 that's when you realize that something's wrong. So sometimes it takes time. And that's why this data verification can be tricky. It requires um, knowledge of the stations, of the locations, and also some experience with what is usual and what could have happened. Uh, ideal, for example, would be if you had a camera, a web camera, and you could look at what's happening next to, um, near the station. But that's something that even we don't have yet, although I was trying to achieve it. But currently, the, the financial situation doesn't allow, does not allow us to, to uh, buy webcams. The webcams are not so expensive. What's more expensive is the data transfer, being able to uh, uh, online uh, transfer the the, um, the video. But that was something I would look into because if it's not verified, it's then um, very tricky in a way that you, for example, say, okay, this station has a very high value. And they tell you, well, but maybe it's not that high. It's not verified. Uh, so then it's very difficult to argue about something. And then you, for example, say, I've noticed that this is very high. And then somebody comes and says, yeah, I deleted it because it was not verified. Um, so that's why you need to have the verified data to be able to argue about anything. 
because otherwise you're in a situation where somebody could just can that just then come and say, oh yeah, that's that's we deleted it because whatever. Yeah. Thank you yeah. Thanks. For, thanks for clarification. I think we can go to the second presentation of Georgi, and then we can still keep some more questions or comments to the end of the of the workshop. So Georgi, please. Uh, maybe yeah. just before we give word to Georgi, can you uh, turn on your cameras for a while, and I would make a joint photo, well, a screenshot. <laughs> Amere bi chartet me govrevo. Ces levis da guarat. Okay, thank you. I guess nobody else is turning on, but that's fine. <laughs> You can go to a Okay, I will share my presentation. Uh -huh. uh, Chance, oh, you can see? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Kamar uh, Joba, well, us. Hello, everyone. Uh, first, begin that uh, thanks for transition. Uh, it's promotion program of Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Czech Republic and thanks Arnika. We have communication, we have cooperation with them and uh, we, we begin the monitoring state system in Georgia. We have now 20 sensors here uh, and we wanted to make it 30 to end of this year. So uh, thanks Arnika, thanks Martin, uh, for everyone, Susanna. Okay, now we will begin uh, we are what we are doing. I think over in Georgia, they will know about us. It's my stick hills and green Paul, uh, the founder of this movement. Uh, it was made in 2018. Our main uh, goal was the um, to make some changes about clean air, water, and food quality. Uh, so we already sold. Uh, with our um, Facebook page and uh, we our communication, we already sold um, 77 problems. Uh, in our Facebook page, there is uh, uh, two to three million engagement on uh, months. Uh, so we are working with our team. In our team, there is uh, uh, 30 people who are working about these changes. So in 2020, our organization Green Pole so far, I'm also the founder of this um, organization. And this organization is also working um, uh, about air, water, and food quality. As already mentioned, we will now have the first uh, sensors in Georgia uh, who are measuring air quality. So uh, now it is uh, we are measuring the PM 2.5, PM 10, and PM 1. And for the next year, we want to make uh, NOx and uh, TVOC. Uh, so it is very, very important uh, for uh, support Arnica in this project. Uh, we also are going to schools and may raise the awareness. We have been in 27 schools and we now we have the three echo books. Uh, so we're solving all these problems. It's all about us. I think everybody in Georgia know about us, who we are and what we are doing. Uh, so where you can find us, it's our Facebook page. It's um, very popular in Georgia. It's Instagram. Uh, this is our uh, web page. Uh, we are translating the articles uh, for all over the world. And um, what's the main important ecological problems? And we are posting it on our web page. And also there is a, a Twitter. So now let's talk about the state monitoring in Georgia. Uh, first, in 2020, we started uh, regularly providing our evidence, our Facebook page and Instagram page. Um, there, Ergoji, uh, you know, everyone, uh, this is uh, Georgian state monitoring uh, web, web page. It's, from, it's governmental. And uh, in, uh, since 2020, we started regularly providing our audience in 
Facebook and Instagram this information about the four cities, uh, Tbilisi, Rustavi, uh, Kutaisi, and Batumi, and we, we were posting it on our Facebook page. Uh, uh, this is the stations, uh, the seven stations uh, in Georgia. Uh, one is no, Batumi, uh, Tbilisi, we have four. One is at uh, Tzaratelli, uh, Varkatili, uh, Armashenebeli and uh, Saburtalo, it's Alexander Kazbeki. There's the uh, traffic uh, stations and uh, there's the background stations. Uh, one is Rustawi and uh, one also is Kutaisi. Now it's in Kutaisi, it's very often it's uh, turning, it, it is not working. So mm -hmm. this is the we have the station also, this eighth station. It was um, in Washington, Juari, and uh, maybe uh, several years, two, one or two years ago, it was uh, moved to Poti, but it did. Uh, they did not uh, operating. So, uh, as I have communication with this uh, government, uh, uh, they they told me that the people did not wanted to add this station at the right place. So now we have the eight uh, stations, as I know, as I have the communication and. Um, but it is not working. It is still on it is, it is not <laughs> providing and operating. Uh, so let's, uh, let's talk about uh, the monitoring uh, station. Where was the, what was the days and uh, air quality? It is normal, bad and really bad. It is from the air go gel. So in Batumi was uh, 120 days, one well, less uh, 300 uh, 65 days, it was till then or the last one year. Uh, 120 days was normal, bad and really bad. Uh, also, uh, one of the most polluted places in uh, Georgia is uh, Tbilisi, Tzaratelli Avenue. Uh, there was since uh, 310 days was normal, bad and really bad. Now it is reconstruction there and um, every day there is a bed, uh, PM 2.5 and PM 10 that is uh, higher. Uh, also, the Armashen and Belly Street, uh, there is also the polluted place. Mm, uh, but um, we have the normal as Warkatili and uh, it's Alexander Kazbek. It is in squares. Uh, Armashen and Belly is in also in a square, it's also background. And Alexander Kazbek, it's uh, also the back is the square, but front is the main road. So, uh, Rustavi, mm, as we know, uh, uh, in Rustavi and Tbilisi, one uh, is one is the most polluted places in East Europe. Uh, so Rustavi, there's uh, also the problem with factories. So uh, there was there was a problem. Uh, there, there is one station as already mentioned. Uh, there was two hundred forty days. Uh, by this, uh, we knew that normal, bad, and really bad. But in Rustavi, uh, much more. Uh, this uh, bad and really bad as uh, red red uh, sign there. Uh, the problems. So in Kutaisi, we don't have right now data is in, in Ergoji. I'm talking about Ergoji. Uh, and this is it. So uh, now it, uh, let's talk uh, about the state monitoring system uh, had some positive, positive changes, including uh, uh, complying with modern European standards and uh, therefore values. There is still a lot of do a lot to improve. Uh, one of the key uh, things being the availability of public information. Uh, there is no information available on topics such as uh, there is no uh, what devices are used by the state of uh, the, to monitoring the air. Um, are there technical parameters set regarding the measurement? Um, uh, uncertainly in 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 accuracy. Uh, is the equipment maintained, uh, collaborated uh, by whom and how exactly, uh, and where uh, this uh, monitoring, uh, how to say, uh, platforms are based on what and uh, the stations are located and uh, they apply rules from their in installation. In another, uh, we had some many problems because we have many act act actives in uh, Tbilisi and in the many places. The last was in Jigaura, it was the 
uh, theta region. Uh, so we had a problem. There was a, um, a factory that was polluting the uh, area, but um, from government uh, there, well, when when they were coming, they they have the hand monitoring stations, uh, and uh, we don't have twenty four uh, hour monitoring stations for the people that uh, they have the problem from near near the house. And it will be good to make this uh, sense because there are so many cases. There is a uh, construction, there are factories, and uh, people must know uh, what air they breathe. But right now we have only seven uh, stations uh, for, for the whole country. Uh, so I think that uh, this, will, this will be uh, to make, uh, to buy from uh, our to make some information from the European countries, uh, 24 uh, hour monitoring stations like this, and not this, uh, how, like, not like this uh, uh, stations, like small, uh, so to know the, what uh, people breathe, because they when they live the near factories, the near the constructions, um, and to make some changes after this. So this was a small about my presentation uh, and uh, fresh air is our right. So we fight for it. And um, thank you everyone for supporting Georgia, supporting us, and we will fight to to breathe the fresh air. Thank you. Let's see if someone has questions. Thanks a lot, Georgi. So now, yeah, we can now come to the questions. So if anybody wants to ask anything, uh, either Yachim or Georgi, it's, it's the time now, and we can still spend some more minutes by discussing the revolution. Um, if I can only comment on that presentation, thank you very much for that. Um, it's actually a very good point, and I have to say I uh, thought that uh, the information about what devices are used and how they work, all the uncertainties are actually available. Uh, that was a surprise to me that they do not publish this information. Um, I will probably not share my screen, but if I look at again at that map that I showed you, if you click on any of those locations, you can look at what parameters are measured. And then if you click on every single one, it tells you exactly what device is used, what uh, technique is used. Uh, for example, in case of DPM, you can use uh, beta uh, rays or you can use optical devices. So those, that information is available. So that was a, a surprise to me that they do not publish this. And obviously that can sort of a shed a sort of a negative light on what exactly is happening with those devices. And a second thing that maybe uh, uh, would also like to comment on your um, presentation is that with the portable uh, devices, we also test these. We have one of those regional offices that you've seen. So we, for example, have that microscope and we focus on other things. Uh, but we also have one regional office that focuses on these smaller, cheap devices, these sensors for monitoring air pollution. Now, um, our experience with these devices is um, they can be used in, very, in, in a very careful manner for, again, approximate values of concentrations. And uh, it can be useful to see trends. It can be useful to see an approximate level of pollution in that area. And it can then work as an indicator of, OK, we should place a proper automated professional station here. These, uh, the, and that assumes that you do a very proper data validation. And in this case, it's much more difficult uh, because it's not just uh, deleting values that don't make sense or, or fill gaps. It's about also recalculating, recalibrating, and then use, they use some very sophisticated mathematical uh, equations to do that. We have a relatively good experience with the sensors that measure PM. When you get to the gases, such as NO2, SO2, it's much more difficult. So I think that the future is in these uh, devices, actually. Uh, I, I hope that in the future we will be able to use these cheap devices and it will make the monitoring much more extensive. Right now, we are still in a situation where these are good. They can already be used, but they should only work as an indicator uh, for an approximate value and, uh, and then some sort of an action uh, from, the, uh, from the government or whoever to place a proper station. So if someone has long-term high values measured by some sensor, that can basically not be compared to any of those threshold values directly in a legal way. You cannot say, okay, it's been exceeded. That would not probably count because that machine can have uh, high uncertainties, but it's a, an indicator that someone should look at it and say, okay, so let's, for example, let's use that measuring vehicle 
place it here for two months and see what we really measure there. And if it really is a problem, then we can talk about placing a, a stationary station. Mm -hmm. I understand. Thanks. Uh, as I do not see anybody's raised hand, uh, I assume that nobody has any question to the presentations. So we are at the end of the workshop and thank you very much for, for coming, for your participation and uh, everybody who participated today will get the materials from the workshop by email in maybe not today, but in coming days. Uh, yeah. Okay, Shako, there is the uh, next question. Hello guys. Hello guys. Hello, hello. I, I guess uh, we had more questions, but not today. Thanks very much, Yakim. Nice to meet you and uh, hope see you soon. So, help. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I only want to add one thing. Um, when Martin says you will get the presentation, on the very last slide, there is an email. So feel absolutely free. If you, if you have a, a question that just comes to you later, um, you can absolutely free to email me. Um, and that's probably the most efficient way. And, uh, and I will try to reply to you as soon as possible. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Shako, do you have a question? Yes, yes. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for the presentations. Uh, and uh, what I want to ask is about a technical question. Um, and um, uh, you were talking about uh, uh, calibrating the devices. And uh, while working with the devices, uh, we had... Um, um, uh, some experience with that and uh, we would like to know more about it if you can speak about that technically like how uh, do you do it on your side uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to calibrating the devices is there some um, uh, some, some uh, I don't know standards or some uh, advices that you can give us uh, while working uh, uh, with devices and calibrating them when it comes to devices that are uh, built by us and yeah that's what I want to know Okay, um, so yeah, we should probably split this into two uh, possibilities. One is the, uh, the sensors. I'm not 100% sure what those stations are that you made, how they're technically built. Usually these, uh, these sensors that we buy, uh, they are available currently uh, in, in, in various shops, these small devices that can measure PM. Usually these very cheap ones that we can buy here uh, cannot be calibrated in any way. That's why uh, it's also sometimes a bit problematic uh, when you talk about the, um, the price, because even though they cost much less, uh, their lifetime is usually a maximum one year. You can use them longer if they work, but then uh, it becomes tricky because that drift uh, becomes more and more significant. Um, when you look at the professional stations, they obviously have they have a, a, a way uh, that is described in the manual how they should be calibrated. The way that this is done is we have another special device, a, a calibrator, which is basically as expensive as the analyzer, uh, but you don't have it at each station. And uh, in our uh, environment, we use calibrations uh, twice a year. So um, every half a year, the technician uses this, this calibrating device, comes to every station, and then what we have is uh, reference gases. So we buy uh, reference gases. So for example, in case of uh, nitrogen dioxide, we buy a reference gas, a gas that I think we even buy from Switzerland. And this gas is almost 100% pure. Uh, it's almost unbelievable how they do it. They actually uh, weigh, they weigh the, the, they determine the weight of the gas. And it's so accurately weighted that you can tell how pure it is. And so we buy this reference gas and that gas is then in very simple uh, words, it's, it's uh, filled into that device. And uh, it, we know the concentration of that 100% pure gas, and that device is calibrated. It's, uh, you basically give it a reference value and say, we know that this is 100% 20 micrograms, so set 20 micrograms to this concentration. And so it's usually the device doesn't like, it can measure the value still correctly, but it sort of loses track of what is uh, the reference value. So. Um, it measures always correctly if it's higher or lower, but the absolute value can be wrong. So that's why we calibrate it. So we get it right to the absolute value. And uh, that's how the professional analyzers are calibrated. Uh, it obviously depends on the method that is used by a particular analyzer, and we use various methods. Um, in terms of the smaller stations, um, 
usually really the, the, the very small sensors cannot be calibrated in any way. And, and, but given the price, um, you usually replace them. Uh, that's like uh, something that, so if we use them somewhere as, a, as an approximate value, um, after a year, we replace, we replace them, even though they still work. Uh, because um, there is really no way, but still these, they, they are still 100, 100, 100 times cheaper than the professional analyzers. They, the professional ones that we use can cost, for example, uh, $30,000. Um, the very cheap ones, you can buy them for, for, for $20. So you see the difference. So even though it works one year, it's still much, much cheaper. Uh, those professional ones can have a lifetime of 20 years, let's say. Uh, but yeah, uh, th that's how the calibration is done. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the answer. Thank you very much for explanation. Is there any other question? Maybe somebody uh, wants to ask something else because this is the last chance. Okay, we do not see any more questions. So thank you very much once more, uh, Joachim and Georgi for presentations and everybody for participation today. And I hope to see you again at our further events that will be uh, focused on air pollution in Georgia. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank, thank you so much. Bye. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Asave, asave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. From Otsulo, because my husband is going to be a Okay, we promote the information. We have a lot of 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 information. We have a l